Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Department of Art and Art History Friday Lecture Series, Friday Speaker Series. I'm here with our own Dr. David Gall and Syracuse University's Dr. Rowling, Dr. James Rowling. Um, David, if, if you want to do the formal introductions, I'll pass it off to you. Good day to you all. Um, please join me in welcoming our featured speaker for today, Dr. James Rowling. Uh, I'll keep these necessary introductory remarks brief so there will be a lot of time for questions and answers um, after, the, after the presentation. So a bit about Dr. Rowling. Dr. Rowling is dual professor of art education and teaching and, and education and teaching and leadership in the College of Visual and Performing Arts and the School of Education at Syracuse University. He is also chair of the art education programs. In his earlier education, Dr. Rowling earned his MFA in studio art. So just keep that in mind. We, many of our art, us art educators are highly qualified studio people as well. Um, so Dr. Rowling is currently president, president elect of NAEA. He is also a member of the International Congress of Qualitative Inquiry. Um, He's editor of Art Education, which is the journal, the bi-monthly journal that art teachers sort of refer to and get a lot of stuff from. Um, he has served on the board of directors of the National Art Education Association, um, acronym is NAEA, and he currently serves as commissioner at large on the new NAEA Research Commission. Uh, I just briefly mentioned his publications. Um, Dr. Rowling recently published Swarm Intelligence, What Nature Teaches Us About Shaping Creative Leadership. Um, he has over 25 peer-reviewed articles and papers, nine book chapters, and four encyclopedia entries um, on, the fine art, on the arts, education, creativity, and human identity. Other recent publications include A Far Easier Silence, Evolving Traditions, Cultural Intersections, Entrance Inequalities, um, and Professional Developments in the Arts and Design Education, From Paradox to Purpose, just to mention a, uh, two of his more recent publications. And with that, he's also president elect, of course, of NAEA, um, so he'll be having a lot of duties soon. I'll stop there um, and turn it over to you, James. Welcome to, to UNCC. <laughs> First of all, I, I wanna say that I am uh, pleased and uh, by the uh, invitation to speak with uh, uh, your students at uh, UNC in Charlotte. Uh, and I have a topic uh, that I've uh, selected, uh, which is called art and community during two pandemics. Uh, at a certain point, I'm going to share my screen. Uh, as a matter of fact, I think I'll do that now. Let's see if I can get there. Let's see here. Okay, share screen. And here we go. Okay, that should be visible, I believe. Yeah, so thank you once again uh, uh, for the opportunity. So uh, I'll, I'll dive right into it. Um, the, the idea of two pandemics, uh, what, what, what am I talking about? What am I getting at? Well, the word pandemic is uh, derived from uh, the Greek word, uh, 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 meaning uh, pan, uh, which means all, and uh, demos, which means people. And it's defined as an epidemic of an infectious disease that has spread uh, across a large region, um, for instance, multiple continents or worldwide, affecting a substantial uh, number of people. So when I'm observing or when I make the observation or the, 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 uh, the claim that we're in the midst of the outbreak of two pandemics, I'm referring obviously not only to the novel coronavirus uh, of 2019, which is also known as COVID-19, uh, which is a strain of virus that has never been detected in humans before, 
But I'm also uh, referring to racism, which is a strain of virulence towards other human beings, which is generations old. Uh, oftentimes, using a metaphor allows you to, uh, to derive deeper meaning. And um, one of the traits of a successful virus is its infectiousness or its ability to be communicated to others, its communicability. Um, now, we're definitely in vulnerable times, um, uh, and that's, that's obvious. Um, and this vulnerability to infection has led me to consider a particular question, which is going to drive what I want to share with you uh, this, this morning. The question is, how does a person or population develop a resistance to a novel coronavirus or an old virulence? Uh, so I'm, I'm going to make sure that I have to, I'm going to advance my slides. I'm going to do a better job of that uh, as I'm talking because uh, I want to show this particular question on the screen. Uh, so in answer to that particular question, uh, I want to say that there is a, uh, 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 I think, uh, something to be benefited by thinking in terms of systems thinking. Uh, so for example, um, the term systemic racism, I, I personally argue is being redundant. Um, According to uh, uh, systems expert Don Don Donella Meadows, I'm going to give a definition. She defines a system as a set of things, so people, uh, cells, molecules, whatever, um, interconnected in such a way that they produce their own pattern of behavior over time. And my argument is that racism all by itself is, is systemic. It, that's its nature. You don't really need a grammatical modifier, you know, systemic racism. Racism is systemic. Now, uh, th taking it a step further, human beings, um, uh, both as individual living organisms and also in terms of our social interactions with one another, are also systemic. Uh, so uh, I, I, I think I've given you the, uh, the definition of, of uh, systems, uh, systems being something that is uh, uh, where an, uh, a set of elements or parts is co uh, organized and becomes more than the sum of its parts so that it produces a, a characteristic set of behaviors, uh, which we also know as a function or purpose. So from a systems perspective, humanity is a superorganism, however, and a virus like, the, like COVID-19 or a social virulence like racism does not affect all its members the same way. So depending on the virus or the virulence, some are carriers, some are super spreaders, uh, some are more vulnerable to succumbing to a particular infection of the body or the human spirit than others. Uh, another word for um, resistance to such infections is immunity. And uh, keeping this in mind, I'm going to ask that question again. Uh, how does a person or population develop a, a resistance or an immune response? to a novel virus or an old virulence. Now, in order to, to take us through this, these considerations, I'm going to share with you two stories um, that I've recently written. You know, I was, my, my time in, in quarantine, it was somewhat productive um, over the summer um, in terms of uh, uh, thinking about these questions about how we, in vulnerable times, how, how do we, uh, develop or strengthen our immune response to, to things that would um, seek to cause us to perish. Um, so one of these is uh, uh, this, uh, this next story, which I'm, this first story, which I'll share, which is called Outbreak, Spreading Vital New Stories in an Age of Viral uh, Contagion. And uh, I, it starts, uh, the thinking began actually um, sometime around March 21st. This was around the time, it was a Saturday evening, um, around the time that my wife and I were first starting to hunker down in earnest here in central New York. Uh, as uh, uh, Dr. Gall mentioned, I'm a professor at Syracuse University. And we were adhering to the, uh, uh, to both the local and the national social distancing advisories during the early days of the first wave of SARS 
COV2, COVID-19, um, as it began its outbreak across the United States. So um, on that night of March 21st, uh, the overnight temperature in Syracuse was dropping to a low of 22 degrees Fahrenheit as it dawned on me that this outbreak was about to significantly change the nature of everyday life for me and everyone I knew for the foreseeable future. Based on initial news reports, uh, from the uh, prior couple of weeks, I had already gathered that a successful virus is considered to be one that is efficient at both replicating itself easily and masking its replication so that it cannot be uh, easily suppressed or halted. By spreading itself rapidly as it exploits the newfound vulnerabilities of its hosts, the most opportunistic of such infections are capable of exploding uncontrollably into a global pandemic, just like the recent novel coronavirus. Um, the COVID-19 disease, uh, um, which was left in its wake. I also learned how, to uh, how a successful effort to slow the spread of any such contagion entails the distancing of its potential hosts to such an extent that the virus can't easily jump to new hosts in the effort to perpetuate its genomic model and pattern of replication. Without a nearby density of new hosts to opportunistically consume, the virus starves, it spreads suppressed and it might even be extinguished. The, um, in this sense, a, a viral outbreak mimics the behavior of a uh, forest wildfire. Uh, effective social distancing and public health management ultimately has the same mitigating effect as a controlled burn in forest management. The latter of which is intended to starve a growing wildfire of any combustible shrubs, tinder, or drought-stricken trees in its path. When uh, the virus approaches, it cannot find the necessary fuel to feed the momentum of its epidemic spread, halting its destructive path. However, controlled burns also make room for new life, which will help keep a forest ecosystem healthy over the long term by burning up fuel, plant debris, and dead trees, pressing the environmental reset button, if you will, and making way for young, healthy trees and vegetation to refresh the local landscape. But on that frigid night, um, March 21st, this was just the engine car driving my train of thought at that time. In the next uh, consideration, or, you know, it was, it was a, like I said, it was a train of thought. Um, uh, the, the, the next thing I'll talk about is a little bit, seems unrelated, but actually is. So some of you may remember a celebrity DJ uh, slash producer slash rapper slash photographer named DJ D nice or a cast what he call a homeschool social distancing distancing virtual dance party from his home uh, in downtown Los Angeles. Uh, DJ D nice invited some people, some folks to join him for the weekend of March 21st on his Instagram live social media platform as a means to stay connected while the uh, during the burgeoning crisis. And then the invitation went viral and everyone came to the party. Well, I personally had never heard of DJ D Nice and I knew nothing directly about the event. A lot of my friends heard about the invitation for their own networks. Um, in a multiple day live stream jam session of mostly hip hop and R&B classics, at one point that weekend, the total number of party goers crowded into that uh, sort of virtual event space spiked to about 104,000. Um, individuals from DJ D Nice's uh, uh, notable list of famous friends along with many more folks that uh, will never come close to celebrity, were desperate to share the story of breaking the new rules of isolation, dancing together in their living rooms and kitchens across the nation at the time. So in the third car of my train of thought, I had run across this Facebook um, social media posting from a friend, Friday cover story published in, on March 19th in Politico News um, uh, it's a news and opinion website. Um, it was titled, Coronavirus Will Change the World Permanently, and here's how. In this article, several big thinkers rather, uh, uh, with either recently published or forthcoming books on macro ideas had been assembled to offer their best predictions, ranging from as little as 79 words to no more than 299 words, about how, for better or worse, this present crisis is about to reorder the way we structure our social interactions and our connections permanently. And that's when I began to rethink contagions. So it goes back to my original 
the notion about immunity and immune systems. We all know that the body's immune system goes to war when a virus uh, invades its healthy functions. Why? Because a virus is a kind of systems hijacker, commandeering the networks already established by other bodily systems, but for its own proliferation. This new coronavirus has a zoonotic origin. What does that mean? It's a big fancy word. So um, a zoonotic disease typically begins as a bacterial or viral or parasitic infection within other animal species. And so some disruption of that animal's natural habitat or life cycle releases um, these contagions to spill over, um, uh, there, uh, thereby spreading unchecked uh, from non-human animals to human beings who have zero immunity to the infection. So from the plague of Justinian, was contributed to the fall of the Roman Empire, to the Black Death, to smallpox, to COVID-19. Um, such uh, zoonotic transmissions, even though they're from the tiniest of organisms, absent of cognition or self-awareness or emotion, have altered entire civilizations of human history. There's uh, an author named David Quammen um, who wrote a book recently called Spillover. Um, he talks about, he's a science writer, he talks about how spillovers happen in two distinct ways. Um, first, we disrupt other non-human ecosystems now more than ever before. We do so for any number of reasons, sometimes to capture animals for food, sometimes to kill animals for sport or frivolity, like shark fin soup or, or pangolin fetus elixirs for virility. Sometimes we destroy animal habitats to appropriate land for financial gain. Secondly, we're now more interconnected than ever before. Um, so with individuals journeying back and forth with ease uh, f uh, to remotely distant uh, places and disrupting those ecosystems back to networks of densely backpacked uh, human global centers, we're sort of like ripe for these kinds of exchanges and these spillovers to take place on any, any given day. Um, there was a recent, um, uh, not recent, but uh, Bill Gates talked maybe uh, some years ago about uh, the danger of such contagions uh, in a well-known um, TED talk. Uh, so his caution is that we're recklessly shaking the tree of life with little comprehension about how it's going to affect our lives. Um, and we've been warned by folks like Gates about how one infectious disease uh, after another is about to shake on down onto our heads because of what we're doing. Um, the more viruses that spill over into our biological life cycles and habitats, the more likely we're going to see individuals perish across the globe. I mean, we've already lost about over a million folks across the world to COVID-19. Um, and so uh, the, the issue there, and I'm going to be conscious of my time because I want to get to another story, is that um, what are we doing that needs to be changed? And how, once again, can we develop a better immune, immune response to um, the kinds of uh, uh, destructions that we're sort of like driving ourselves towards as we move towards that cliff or what I would call a nosedive um, as we, you know, release these contagions. Uh, because this this what we're doing, what's happening right now with COVID-19 is not going to be the last one. Um, and as a matter of fact, we're only in the first wave of COVID-19. This is not to be uh, uh, alarmist or pessimistic, but that's just the nature of what human beings are doing. But what can we do that's different? So um, let me, uh, a few days after I was having this train of thought, um, I uh, was channel flipping uh, to uh, uh, on HBO and ended up uh, listening to uh, watching a film called Tolkien, which was based on the, the uh, young J.R.R. Tolkien who, who wrote uh, the Lord Hobbit, the Lord of the Rings trilogy. And he was, uh, it, was it was sort of an autobiographical film, uh, not an autobiographical, but biographical film. And it was talking about his uh, uh, sharing about his uh, conversation with his mentor, uh, Oxford University Professor Joseph Wright, about the importance of words. Um, ultimately, getting to the notion that we must tell essential stories, stories that we can live by, 
um, not just words, because words without meaning are merely sounds. And so as artists, um, we have a unique capacity. This is what I want to get and an interpretive capacity, a reinterpretive capacity. Um, making art is akin to making stories. And it's often practiced as, as a skill set for making beautiful things. It's a very limited way of looking at why people make art and what purpose, the purpose of arts, if the arts are. But I would argue that the larger purpose of the arts and creative solutions is simply to create contagions, creative contagions, um, contributing stories to live by, hope for tomorrow, and models for better living, so that um, our better ideas can spread an improving mentality across our relational uh, networks. Um, and this need for newly imagined stories to live by here in, in 2020 cannot be overstated. Uh, Plato once observed that the natural food of the stories are the natural food of the young. Um, but on second look, um, stories are have proven to be, or especially new stories, reinterpreted stories, are uh, proven to be exactly what we need in times of crisis. Um, they've been restorative. They've helped us to regain our bearings, to course correct, um, to pull out of our most lethal and divisive behaviors in the nick of time. Recognizing that we're all in this together, or that we're in an all in this together moment here in our, our global, our global uh, human um, story, uh, even as we face this as existential threat, uh, we have the capacity to change the world, to change and spread stories that matter. Um, the idea that black lives matter, the idea that art matters, that creative solutions matter, that habitat matters, that climate matters, that health matters, that humility matters, that love matters. And like I say, since we're only in the first wave of the pandemic, there will be more loss. But these are the kinds of stories, if we, um, once again, flip the script, um, that we can hijack and reboot uh, this the the our particular way of thinking these days, this, this sort of like nosedive um, kind of thinking, we can reboot that in this era and beyond. And there's a good chance that we'll do more to survive if we do so. We'll actually learn to thrive. Now, the, uh, the next uh, uh, story that I want to share is also something that I wrote this summer. Um, and um, it uh, stems uh, specifically after uh, George, uh, George Floyd's uh, murder. So um, this one is called uh, Broken Promises. Once again, I'll try to abbreviate it so that I can get through and uh, allow for the questions and answers afterwards. Um, kids know when a promise has been broken. You can see it in their eyes. At some point during my own elementary schooling, I became convinced that the Pledge of Allegiance that we were expected to recite each morning became a lie as it passed through my lips, because I did not believe that I lived in a nation with liberty and justice for all. Maybe for some, but not for the people in my neighborhood, not in Crown Heights, Brooklyn. It's not my nature to recite meaningless, meaningless words, it never has been. So I stopped saying the pledge as a child without any fanfare or bravado. I saw no need to ask for permission. I was a gifted learner, but I was also socially precocious. So I knew that whether I said the pledge or not was my decision alone to make. No one could make me tell a lie. Naturally, I would stand with all the other kids. I was already different, so I did not like standing out. I still don't. Um, but if any teacher was really paying attention to, attention to me back then, they would have noticed that my hand was not raised to my heart and I no longer uttered the, word, uh, the words of this pledge. Then again, paying attention to me was not what any of my teachers signed up for when my parents started busing me all the way to the other side of Brooklyn to get the same quality of education available to the white kids who lived in Sheepshead Bay. I was from Crown Heights. It was paradoxically easy to overlook the only black kid in any given classroom at PS52. The social contract prevalent in the late 1960s and early 1970s required that um, almost pretending that my presence changed nothing whether you wanted me in that school building or not. Folks either claimed a kind of colorblindness, rendering my identity invisible, or they kept their distance, treating me like I had intruded their private island. Many years later, I did um, this uh, 
uh, this uh, pen pencil, colored pencil uh, portrait that you're seeing here of a little girl emerging from behind the uh, American flag. Like I was, she's silently aware of where she stands. You can see it in her eyes. And just after the uh, murder of um, George Floyd, uh, in broad daylight by Minneapolis officers in late May of 2020, during the first wave of the uh, uh, coronavirus pandemic, Trevor Noah, the popular comedian and social commentator, shared some powerful insights about broken social contracts uh, on a, an online segment of the quarantine edition of his popular TV series, cleverly entitled This Daily Social Distancing Show. At the 8.30 mark of this, uh, mark of this particular episode, uh, uh, Mr. Noah began an impromptu reflection on the nature of society and broken social contracts. He framed his argument by pointing out that society, as we've come to know it, is like a contract a written, spoken, or, or unspoken agreement between individuals to behave a certain way toward one another in order to maintain a mutually beneficial relationship. And Noah's analogy is society functions as if to say, amongst this group, uh, uh, this group of us, we agree in, in common rules, common ideals, and common practices that are going to define us as a group. Um, given that um, a broken contract fundamentally breaks the social relations. Noah knows about such broken contracts. Um, uh, Trevor Noah was raised in Johannesburg, South Africa, and he was born into a broken society. His best-selling book, uh, Born a Crime, is a reference to the fact that Noah's birth in 1984 was still a crime in apartheid South Africa, when it was illegal for his so-so mother and his uh, Swiss father to be in a loving interracial relationship. Noah asks us, what vested interest does anyone have in maintaining a contract that has already been broken? Um, now, uh, the, the next image I'll share, uh, I'll give you a heads up, a trigger warning. Um, but I, but I, need to, I need to show the image. The um, breaking a social contract in a civil society leaves behind a tunnel of, of uh, deep tunnel of repercussions. Allowing oneself to be bound by a broken contractual agreement benefits only the promise breaker and perpetually handcuffs individuals who have either been, booz been bamboozled or worse. Moreover, the response to broken civility is not always likely to be, to be civil. In George Floyd's case, he was suspected of a minor infraction and in response was violently confronted by several police officers who were sworn by oath to protect and serve the general public, including Floyd. Instead, Floyd was tortured to death over the course of eight minutes and 46 seconds as they kneeled on his body and throat, causing his cardiopulmonary functions to cease. For the final two minutes and 53 seconds of having a knee pressed down on his throat, George Floyd was non-responsive and had left his body, and you could see it in his eyes. Broken social contract, broken society. The post-quarantine protests to repair the damage have been weekly and spreading from city to city ever since because the pledge to end police brutality had been broken time and again prior to George Floyd's killing. The um, broken promises, however, can be repaired, and kids know this too. Uh, whether we ask them or not, children have a valuable perspectives and opinions to share. When I was still working as a New York City elementary school teacher, I made a practice of asking kids to express their opinions and, and opinions, the opinions and their ideas visually. One year, a fourth grade, the uh, fourth grade teaching team in my school agreed on a, a, a trimester theme of uh, social justice. Since we were still in the wake at that time of the 2004 presidential elections, conversations about the candidates among the children and their families, both at home and at school, were at a high. And I proposed the idea of having each student, each fourth grader, create their own political cartoon in one of our, as one of our art studio units. I began by asking each child to share an injustice in the world that he or she wanted to help make better, and then to do a drawing of the problem and a solution. One of my students named Ian uh, responded with a visceral rending of how human society was being irresponsible and was pledged to be good stewards to the natural world by overhunting animals and carelessly starting fires destroying the natural habitat that animals need in order to, to thrive. I then asked Ian and his classmates to depict what they could do to repair the damage they had observed. Every child without fail came up with solutions to the injustice or problem that moved them the most. 
If a child can imagine solutions for an injustice, then so can you and I. The, um, so I would ask what social contracts cry out the most for repair? Thinking once again about that, sen that sentence, uh, that the, the, the original conception I had about uh, developing an immune response. Um, well, ask a child what hurts and they'll tell you. Back in 1976, an episode of Bill Moyer's journal aired on PBS titled Rosedale, The Way It Is, documenting the nearly all white community of Rosedale in the borough of Queens, New York, which had been protesting against black families moving into the area since the summer of 1974. Moyers uh, interviewed the Spencers, a black family whose move to Rosedale was immediately met with accusations of blockbusting, uh, which is a term at the time for trying to force lower property values on Rosedale homes so that other blacks could afford to buy there. So in other words, simply by existing and being alive and pre pre uh, present in the home that they had purchased in the Rosedale community, the Spencers were accused of attempting to destroy the Rosedale community. The Spencer home was doused with ca gasoline, set on fire, it was pipe bombed, it was littered with foul racial epithets and their children were targeted by seething mobs of white children almost daily. The social contract of civility was obliterated. One such assault was caught on camera for this documentary and was precipitated when a few black kids on bikes saw a large American flag being carried and rode uh, toward it, assuming that there was a parade happening. Almost every child loves a parade, right? So what they encountered was a demonstration to get the, quote, niggers out of Rosedale. Um, after being surrounded, spit at, pelted by stones, um, one child was asked, do you forgive them? And her response, uh, was no, no, you can't take back no hurt. Now, in a recent uh, New York Times interview, that same girl, now woman, was asked uh, to reflect uh, on, on how that flag drew them into that situation, which was transformed uh, that sunny day into uh, the flag, which was transformed to a symbol of do not enter, essentially. You can still see the pain in her eyes. Uh, the same pain you saw in her eyes uh, in this little snippet when she was a child. And they'd ask her the question about how, how could she, you know, could she forgive? So it's a trauma of 400 years of incidents. It's not just what she experienced 45 years ago. And that's the, sort of the thing about, um, about uh, racism. It's, it's not just what happened to me or to you. It's a trauma of 400 years of incidents that, precip uh, that precipitated the Roselle assault that was captured on film. Same tunnel, different rabbit hole. In the run-up to the national elections this November, partisan talking, talking headed reactionaries have begun warning their listeners to fear an onslaught of radical politics and lawlessness and riots and looting across the United States. Yet it's hard to think of any behavior as radical as an ideology so hell-bent on maintaining its accumulated advantages that it pretends that 250 years of enslaving people and tearing families apart for, uh, for free labor, 90 years of Jim Crow era terrorism, 60 years of separate and inherently unequal, unequal uh, schooling, 35 years of state sanctioned uh, red, redlining practices segregating our local neighborhoods have all been remedied by electing an African-American as the 44th president or by hiring a few more black CEOs. 400 years of systemic oppression to create a national topography of hidden burrows, a landscape of rabbit holes, to lineages of individualized and family traumas. The ability of a few African-Americans to climb to high plateaus does nothing to fill in a vast subterranean complex of interconnected traumas stretching from sea to shining sea. Sea to shining, shining sea. So one more image that I'd like to show here, and then I'll close it. Um, and um, have some other reflections. Uh, a surveillance uh, video recently went viral showing a nine-year-old black boy named Elijah who was innocently dribbling a basketball in his family's driveway in an affluent neighborhood of Connecticut. When he noticed a police uh, patrol car turning down his street, Elijah's father posted footage of his son ducking behind a, uh, a vehicle parked in the driveway emerging to continue shooting baskets only once the police cruiser had driven past their home. 
What stunned Mr. Pierre Lewis most about his son's behavior was is that his family didn't talk negatively about the police in their household, and the effort had actually been to shelter the kids from the news. Yet when his father asked uh, why he hid, Elijah replied, because they killed George Floyd. In the surveillance tape, Elijah is silently aware of where he stands in his own driveway. Broken social contracts are broken promises. And kids know when a promise has been broken. If I could draw a portrait of Elijah today, I would focus, focus, focus first on his eyes. And that was the end of that uh, conclusion of that particular story. So where that leaves me um, is uh, with this uh, notion that I started with about uh, generating an immune response uh, as a generative metaphor for anti-racism, for, um, for develop, developing community, sustainable community in the midst of two pandemics. And the interesting thing about it is that if you think about the analogy enough, it becomes fascinating um, because there are lots of different layers to immune responses. Matter of fact, folks don't realize the first line of defense in immune responses are, are all uh, aspects of uh, that we were born with, so to speak. Um, so, for instance, our skin is a is a is a part of our the first line of defense against infections and uh, and uh, and viruses and the like. Um, our mucus, which traps bacteria in small part particles, our cough reflex is another innate immune response. Um, so it's called, this is called innate immunity. Um, stomach acid, you know, things that you, you, you swallow and eat, consume that could do damage. Stomach acts as it works as, a, as an innate immune response. Then there are such things as acquired immunity, um, uh, uh, where, you know, if you get repeated exposures to certain things, you develop a, a resistance against them. Um, Passive immunity is the idea that like when kids, uh, it's infants, uh, babies in the womb, uh, antibodies are passed from the mother into the, and the child. Those disappear after a certain point, but those are, that's passive immunity. Um, uh, our blood system um, uh, also has natural um, white blood cells that sort of fight against uh, 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 infections and invaders, so to speak. So the point, being that uh, ultimately, if we get back to that question about how we, uh, how we as individuals uh, uh, or as populations uh, develop a, a, a resistance or an immune response to a novel virus or an old virulence, um, there's any number of ways of doing it. And I would make the argument that one of the ways of doing so is through uh, the idea of developing new stories to live by, the arts having a central role in that kind of storytelling, um, even to the extent of the, the images that I've shared, that I've drawn, uh, the, uh, uh, the, the stories that I've written, and there are many different uh, uh, ways that the arts are uh, convey the stories that we need to know in order to sort of bolster ourselves against those who are carriers and super spreaders of, of uh, virulence that has um, damage so many lives. So with all I'd said, these are the considerations that I have and I want to share with you this morning. Um, and I wanted to uh, close here to allow for, um, I'm going to stop share, uh, to allow for a uh, questions and answers based on who, whoever will um, guide that aspect of the, of our, our conversation today. So thank you for your attention. Thank you, Dr. Rowling. <clears throat> that was great. Um, David, did you want to add anything? I'm sorry. No, I'm, I'm well, I think we just open for questions because, you know, time is tight. Yeah. Well, we've got a, a, a question from Dr. Dr. Frakes in our department. Um, and he's uh, asking about the quote from Plato uh, about um, uh, stories have great power to affect social order and stories uh, as being food for young people. And he was saying, you know, part of that quote is that Plato was advocating for 
strict st uh, censorship of, of certain stories. Um, and that stories could also ha include lies and, and um, advocate for repre reprehensible behavior. Mm -hmm. And in thinking about society and stories and censorships, how can we benefit from a story like Trevor Noah's without mm -hmm. falling victim to the stories that perpetuate, you know, lies and, and, and disinformation like a, a Rush Limbaugh or something. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, you raise a good point. Uh, it's, it's arguably one of the reasons why um, America is in the state that it's in is because um, we have become more susceptible to uh, propaganda because of the nature of the communication medium, mediums for communication d deliver bullet points and sound bites and snippets that are decontextualized and and make it easy to even take something that was not meant for uh you know if you listen to it in context you know uh you know uh, you know i'm thinking about noah's book um a beautiful uh book in, in its totality but if you take a sentence out and just sort of say Trevor noah said this you can use it as a weapon against them you can weaponize um and um so I, I think that uh, just a quick answer, because I want to make sure I'll try to answer these six, or address these six, succinctly. Uh, one has to be aware of the fact that uh, that storytelling can be weaponized in the form of propaganda. It's as old. No, it's not. Un, it's not new. It's just that it's become much more efficient at it. Um, but I do believe very much in the power of reinterpretation, um, reinterpreting old stories. For for example, the idea that um, you know, that, that existed for uh, generations. The United States said that, that uh, folks of color were, were monsters, dangers, um, uh, 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 threats, and, and even to the, to the extent that it still, that still carried that subtext of seeing me in a space, I should be careful, I should, is he a threat? That, 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 that it carries through no matter, you know, uh, even though I, most people don't find me very threatening, uh, but still, this the symbol of my skin becomes a symbol that that sort of harks back to old stories that were untrue, um, that were dangerous stories. So, um, but when folks began to talk about black being beautiful and entering those stories into the into the into the context of the social discourse, those those stories they began to have a catalytic effect. Began to to reshape the way people understood um, African Americans and their, uh, 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 in terms of their culture and their contributions, and um, it began to do battle. It's sort of like throwing throwing things to the petri dish, and all of a sudden, um, uh, some some important things happen. So the key, though, is to generate the new stories. If you don't generate the new stories, if you don't generate the the stories that are of real life, flesh and blood, my experiences. So, for example, I just wrote a memoir um, called "Growing Up Ugly." Um, a daydream uh, of a, a, you know, a memoirs of a black boy daydream. It will come out in December. Um, uh, it talks about a lot of the uh, uh, the 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 uh, issues that my father, as a practicing artist, uh, engaged, uh, you know, had to encounter uh, post civil rights movement. Um, a lot of the issues that I dealt with growing up, uh, being bused to an all white school, um, and puts that out as a new story that. that is meant to uh, 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 be a catalyst for other folks to seek the power of their imagination, their power, uh, their creative agency, their creative superpowers to strengthen those and to sharpen those as a way of, as, as a buffer, as an immune response against uh, a, a, in a dangerous world, in a world that, that would seek to do harm. Um, uh, I do believe that um, understanding the, the potency and the agency of, of one's own creativity is an underutilized uh, 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 storytelling tool because essentially we write our own stories as we go, you know, like Harold and his purple crayon, right? And just make our own portals, make our own, our own avenues as we go. So um, uh, I think I've answered that or addressed that, but yeah, that's how I would uh, think about that. Yeah, that, I, I think that, that that's a great answer, great response. And 
um, you know, that we need to, you know, there's a momentum to these things, mm -hmm. right? And that mm -hmm. we need to be generating new stories and, and uh, responding to the misinformation and yeah. propaganda in effective yes. ways. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, we, we have, this is the first talk where we have more uh, faculty <laughs> questions, <laughs> which, is, which is great. Uh, our uh, chair, Dr. Thompson, uh, says thank you so much for your presentation, Dr. Rowling. Um, how do we use your analogy of, of, the, of the virus of, of racism to, uh, and, and stories we can tell um, to apply to a higher education structure that um, these institutions that may block uh, change and acceptance? Yeah, so um, this summer, as I said, as I said was um, productive for me. And one of the things that happened um, in the last couple of months is I've written an open letter to all creatives not just in the arts education field, but folks in museum studies, or museum education and, and the arts, uh, uh, those who, who, are, who collect art, those who, who make art. Um, that open letter was written on, in my role um, as president-elect of the National Art Education Association, but also as the chair of their uh, Equity, Diversity and Inclusion Commission. Um, and it was, I was asked to do it. I, I thought very long and hard about doing so um, because I was in a vulnerable state myself. But in it, I take a systems approach to finding, uh, to, uh, to thinking about um, how you create an anti, how you go about constructing your own anti-racist agenda in your, whatever it is that you do, whatever your job is um, uh, in, in relation to the arts. Um, that open letter, you can find that uh, if you go to the NAEA, which is the National Art Education Association a website, um, there's a page there, look up open letter, Black Lives Matter. Um, you can find that there. You can share it with your community there at UNC at Charlotte. Um, uh, but I, I remember I spoke earlier about the idea of um, uh, uh, that, that systems thinking is much more important than we recognize. So I'm um, going back to Donella, Donella Meadows um, and her book, Thinking in Systems. Um, she came up with uh, this uh, uh, set of 12 leverage points in terms of intervening into a, in, in a system, intervening in a system. And once again, uh, I, I go back to the fact that racism in itself is systemic. So, so um, I drew upon those leverage points to, to, to create a scaffolding of 12 different uh, 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 possible uh, avenues for intervening in a, in a racist system, uh, uh, a racist uh, structure. Um, and, um, and, and uh, uh, the scaffolding is such that it's a scaffolding. So I gave certain suggestions, but you can take my suggestions out and just using the scaffolding that, that, uh, that I've given the architecture, but you can build your own uh, set of interventions based on what the issues are at your locality, at your institution. Uh, and so, uh, so I, I, I've tried to be as, as helpful as possible in terms of creating that. And so I just invite people to have a look at it. It's successful, it's easy to read, uh, and, um, and it's um, uh, based on theory, sound theory. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, there's a, a, another question from our colleague, Heather Freeman, who is a, a great, great artist and educator as well, um, and also a parent. And, um, you know, dealing with, uh, you know, the, the education system in, in this time of COVID, uh, do you have advice for uh, artists, educators, current and future parents? how to mitigate the effects of, you know, this change to our education system that, you know, and I, I guess I, I would add to that, like, do you have any opinions on, you know, we know that education is being, uh, I, these are my words, threatened in, in ways by, by our current uh, uh, presidential administration. Um, so do you have any, any insights or advice into, into how we look look forward and, and progress effectively in these days with that. Yeah. So um, uh, thanks for that question. Uh, I I mentioned in one of the stories that I shared uh, encountering that political article uh, having to do with um, rethinking this uh, coronavirus uh, to change the world permanently. Here's how you can find that it was published March nineteenth. I have suggested 
uh, that, um, and, I, and mind you, I'm not, you know, other people have, have, have done this on, on their own. In other words, it's not like I, I, I'm, you know, I'm orchestrating anything behind the eyes curtain, but, but to me, to my, to my eyes, as I say, um, out of necessity, businesses, small businesses, big businesses, uh, educational uh, institutions, museums have been in, 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 a, in, in over the past months uh, since the, the, the virus broke, um, reinventing themselves nece necessarily, um, rethinking themselves, reconceptualizing what they do. Some have discovered the things that they've done. In the past. For instance, the fact that we're using a Zoom pl platform Zoom was never to be intended to be used the way it's being used today. Um, it's uh, it it it, uh, it, it, it was, but but the uh, the point is that it was it already had certain ideas which were which made it natural. I mean, we're even using Zoom as a ter ter terminology. Did you, uh, did you Zoom? How many times did you Zoom today? Right. <laughs> so I mean, it's you know that was because it was something op I won't say opportunistic, um, but an op it, it was prepared for the moment. Um, and other folks are realizing that the moment has changed things in such a way that we have to look very closely to sort of see how what we're having to do now uh, it becomes an opportunity to keep on doing it um, uh, or to rethink what we were doing before and say, and let's not go back to that as, as, the, as the old moment. If we have to create a new moment. And now, of course, I'm being very, we're speaking very broadly here um, uh, because I've, I've noticed that like in my own teaching, um, working using the platform, the Zoom platform um, creates, uh, even though it creates a distance, you know, we're virtual, there's a distance that's there, but it also allows for a kind of intimacy of conversation where everybody's sort of facing one another um, in a virtual platform and we're able to talk about one another's work. You know, I teach a curriculum design course and where we, we, we basically practice based, we work on their, their weekly explorations and materials and methods and then turn that into curriculum ideas and talk about it with one another and workshop it together. We do that from week to week. Um, but the point being that I've actually enjoyed the way that I've had to teach that in terms of sort of, it's become much more fruitful in a way that I, I would never have thought of. I would never have thought of doing that um, unless I was forced to, right? And I discovered that, oh, there's certain things that I want to keep on doing, right? Mm -hmm. I didn't expect that, right? And obviously there's certain things which we hate, which is being sitting in front of the computer all, the computer all day. Um, so. <laughs> I'm just saying there that uh, this is a time for pivoting uh, and for uh, uh, just reconceptualizing new thinking. Um, uh, you know, this is not, you know, I, I speak optimistically. This, there's not a lot of time left for this particular administration, um, misadministration as I call it. Um, and there are, there's, there, with whatever's coming ahead, uh, we need to be ready to um, think entrepreneurially uh, think, um, uh, like I said, like Harold and his purple crayon, creating our way as we go, right? Um, and so, you know, the, the, I don't know if I've answered that well, but uh, I just think this is a time to 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 rethink everything. Great, thank you, thank you. That's that's excellent. Mm -hmm. um, there's a, a question from a student. Um, you discussed uh, broken contracts, bro uh, broken social contracts, um, mm -hmm. and the breakdown of, of society. How mm -hmm. can we effectively integrate um, new, better social contracts in our, into our society in order to facilitate a more sustainable, um, more diverse community? So uh, you know, I'll just I'll utilize the uh, uh, the example that I gave, which is where I asked um, my fourth graders to think about broken social contracts. Essentially, I didn't use those terms, but essentially, like, what, what is what's something that's broken in the world? Something that you think is an injustice that uh, an injustice that you want to fix? And then, then I asked them the follow-up question: Is now how about how would you go about addressing it? How would you go about fixing it? Um, I think I place a lot of um, faith in, in folks saying, you know something, you all didn't do it, do anything. You all can't do anything. I'm going to get out here and do something myself. 
Um, now that's sometimes, you know, you need to, you know, find the, the rest of the, 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 your forces to lock on with in order to actually do what you think you want to do or what you'd like to do. But that, that intent is powerful. Um, but I do think that, um, um, in many senses, the current generation has screwed things up for the next generation. Um, so there's a part of me that says I, I would be confident in hearing this student's ideas about what he or she uh, thinks is the best way to go about fixing a particular problem. Because there's been many different problems to address, right? It's not just one. And yes, they are interconnected often, but still you, you sometimes you have to address one at a time in order to be, to stay sane and not try to think you gotta fix the world, right? right. Um, so um, so the, the short of it is that I, I, I uh, almost would want to defer to the student rather than saying, I think you should do this. I want to hear what their idea is, because um, I think it's the generation of new ideas, the introduction of new ideas, ideas that I wouldn't necessarily think of. I think that's the saving grace. Well, and I, I mean, thinking about my own education and upbringing from, you know, a young person to now, one of the things you brought up in your talk, like the the, the block busting, which was, I, I mean, I, I was aware of, you know, real estate values and, and diversity and, and things in neighborhoods, but never these, these kinds of terms to it. And just Big, the idea. Essentially, it was, a, it was a conspiracy theory. I right. You, you came to our block to destroy our neighborhood. Right. right. You know, what, what are you going to do with that? Right. And to know, I mean, to, to, you know, know these things, to know that there, there are broken social contracts rather than being taught from a young age, that there isn't injustice, that everything's, you know, rosy and, and ready to go for you. I, I think that will, you know, that education, like you're doing with the, you used an example with the fourth graders, just having them with that mentality, I think will change, you know, the generations to come and, and change, change how those social contracts are, are made and, and who they include. So, mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. Um, thank you so much, uh, uh, Dr. Rowling. This was, this was great. Um, and uh, yeah, I, we're, we're kind of out of time. So I, I, I really appreciate it. Um, David, did you want to add anything? Well, I, of course, uh, I cannot sit, but say like how happy I, I, I am. And, and I'm sure um, the whole department is, is so glad that you can make this um, happen. Um, it isn't often that and for me in particular and for the art education area, you know, it isn't often that we have an art educator of your stature coming and talking to a student body. Um, so thanks very much for a really challenging, um, um, provocative um, talk. I think it is timely, you know. Um, one doesn't, it, I, I, I'm gonna tell all students this, and I'm sure you appreciate it. Any talk is to provoke thinking, not for you to agree with anybody. Mm -hmm. it, it, it's to really generate, thinking and thought about solutions to really pressing problems that we have. Mm -hmm. And I think you touched on some of the most pressing ones, the two most pressing ones perhaps, <laughs> <laughs> that we are confronting <laughs> right now. Um, so thanks very much again um, for, for doing this talk with us. No, it was my pleasure. It was my pleasure. And yeah.